for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR FM 89. Well, hello and welcome to Arkansas Week. I'm Dawn Scott. Thanks for being here. The Arkansas Supreme Court has agreed to expedite the appeal of a ruling that would keep the LEARNS Act from being implemented immediately. A Pulaski County Circuit Judge ruled two weeks ago that the legislature did not follow proper procedure in enacting an emergency clause. If that is allowed to stand, the governor's education overhaul would likely take effect August 1st which is the typical 90 day length of time for a new law to begin. Joining me for an update on this is Antoinette Grajeda. She is the senior reporter for the Arkansas Advocate. She has covered this topic extensively and we are so glad to have you here. Thanks for having me. Well, let's just start with the uh, Supreme Court's consideration. It's, it's not a ruling on the merits of this case. It's just an agreement to take it up early. So mm -hmm. how soon could we get a ruling on the appeal? Sure, so as a part of yesterday's announcement, they set kind of a calendar for when briefs can be expected and reply, reply briefs. So the first um, is due the July 28th and briefs will follow between then and August 18th. Now they don't have to take that full amount of time. So that's what we saw when the, we had the temporary restraining order earlier in the year, the same thing where the uh, Supreme Court granted this expedited review and they actually did it within the span of about two weeks. So we could see something within two weeks if it mirrors that, um, but likely it's looking like a ruling will come after the law goes into effect on the first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because August 1st is when it's, it's about two weeks place. away, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, the, again, with just a few weeks away before it would, would take effect, what is the urgency here then? Well, I haven't talked to um, state officials yet about like what their reasoning is behind this, um, but since this is what they did prior with this previous um, appeal to the state court, the uh, Supreme Court perhaps is just following procedure again. So that's, that's, that's a possibility, you know, just kind of this is the way that we do this. Um, also, there's also in the background, um, we talked about this last time, a petition referendum. People are trying to get enough signatures so that they can get on the ballot a, um, let people vote in 2024 on whether or not to repeal this law. And so as a part capes. of that, CAPES, yeah, mm -hmm. Citizens, um, oh gosh, Citizens for Arkansas Public Education and Students, I think, mm -hmm. <laughs> if I got that right. Uh, yeah, so if this gets on the ballot for 2024 where folks can vote on repealing the law, part of what, uh, the way the law is written is that the law in question will be paused. So they have until the end of the month to get these signatures submitted and approved by the Secretary of State's office. So if the law is not in effect until the first, then it could it could be paused again for the duration um, until the the ballot uh, election in 2024. So wow, that's also a so piece. Hypothetically, hypothetically, it could take effect August 1st if CAPES gets the needed signatures. It, it would put the law in abeyance is the way that it's written, right? Because mm -hmm. initially when we asked the Attorney General's office for clarity on this when this whole petition um, started, effort started, he said that, you know, it won't be paused because if there's an emergency clause and it's already in effect. Well, now we're questioning the emergency clause. So yeah. there's a lot of dominoes and a lot there of laws. There are a lot, a of, lot laws. of dominoes <laughs> things at to learn. play here. Well, last week in a, spe a special meeting, the State Board of Education voted to take over the day-to-day -day operations. Mm -hmm. We discussed this last time as well of the Marvel Elaine district. But uh, before the judge's ruling, the state had been pursuing a transformational contract. Mm -hmm. This is so complex to me. Would you explain sure. what this means? Sure, I'll, I'll try. Okay. <laughs> so again, this kind of goes back to uh, those dominoes that we're looking at. So so they were pursuing this transformation contract, which is part of the LEARNS Act, and it allows a struggling school to partner with a third party in lieu of a state takeover. And so they were doing that when this lawsuit happened. And um, now that the law won't go into effect until the first, assuming all these things work the way, out, we, the way we think they are, that means you can't pursue that contract until the first. So the reason they called this board meeting was to provide some clarity and um, about next steps for the district because they've really been in this state of limbo as there's been this back and forth mm -hmm. on the lawsuit. As um, Education Secretary Jacob Oliva pointed out, you know, there's a lot of things that have to happen before the start of school in August. A mm -hmm. lot of schools can start the week of the 14th. So if you only have two weeks to make those plans, that's a very truncated amount of time. 
And so what they did is the board voted to um, remove the limited authority board, so basically the school district, yes. uh, the school board of the district and the superintendent and appointed, uh, Aliva has the authority to appoint a new superintendent. And he said, now we can take steps to prepare for the school year by hiring teachers, buying books, setting the calendar, things like that. Mm -hmm. So it was really about doing that. But the, but the goal, he said, you know, is once the law is in effect, we're, this is still our intention is to pursue that contract and get that moving along. Well, that was my next question, just what this does to these districts, to the teachers, to the mm -hmm. students, to the administrators. Right, so there's been a lot of, a lot of questions, a lot of uncertainty um, at this meeting. Officials said about 190 students had already re-enrolled. Um, we're not sure about the other students yet. There's about 306, according to uh, Department of mm -hmm. Education um, numbers for this last year that were enrolled. But it is a lot of questions because also if you're a teacher, you know, and you're worried about if you're going to have a job or not, you could have, and some have said like, oh, well, these people are going to apply to other places. And so then how are we going to hire folks for mm. this? Well, the legal challenge was brought by a group of parents and educators from the district as the state had been pursuing a transformational contract with an outside entity, the Friendship Education Foundation. And we do have a clip from that meeting with the state education secretary, Jacob Oliva, as you mentioned, discussing the challenges of this situation. The local board as well as superintendent Katina Ray were removed. So let's see this now. The easy thing for us to do would recommend to just close the district. The challenging thing for us to do as an agency is to fight for what's right in this community and eliminate failure. And that's what we're coming to you today to do, to say we still think if we make the right decision as a board, we can move forward with full implementation of a transformational contract to go into effect August 1st, but we need authority as a state agency to start making decisions to get that contract in ready because we got to hire staff, we've got to order textbooks, we got to build out bus rights, we've got to build out a master schedule. There are things that we need to do. My interest is for these children. Would I like to remain in the district? Of course. Uh, I've done everything as a superintendent that I could do, and I want to say that publicly to try to make this work, but it's been very difficult. That's why I called, I called and asked for help. Hmm. You know, you can really hear the emotion uh, on so many levels. Mm -hmm. What do you make of this? The whole situation there has been very emotional for everybody involved. I was there in April when they, the state board went to Marvel Elaine to um, have their meeting and discuss um, what would happen with the school in the future. And there's just a lot of moving parts. It's, it's more than just mm -hmm. academics. It's more just, just you know issues with fiscal, which they had previously some fiscal issues as well. It's very much about this community and what the schools mean to the community. There are two schools. It's a very small rural community. And a lot of them have said, you know, this is the heart of our community and if these close, you know, this, mm -hmm. you know, a, a lot, a lot of times you can see these, these towns just disappear because mm -hmm. there's nothing there anymore. Mm -hmm. And, and that is really part of the issue as mm -hmm. well. These tiny communities, these students, these families mm -hmm. and the teachers who, you know, care deeply for them. Um, you know, the State Board of Education has meantime approved emergency rules to set up a voucher program yes. for private schools, which is another facet to this. Yes. Explain where we are there. Sure, absolutely. So even though there's this lawsuit ongoing, the Attorney General's office had said, you know, we can still take steps to prepare. So one of the ways that they are preparing are these emergency rules that the board um, approved yesterday at its, its regular meeting. Um, the rules were not made public prior to the meeting, but I asked for a copy after, and a lot of it mirrors the language in the LEARNS Act. So it talks a lot about who's eligible in the first year because this will be phased in. And so, um, you know, students with disabilities, foster children, students at schools with, um, that are, have an F rating like Marvel Elaine, they would be eligible. So there's a lot of that in there. And then there's also some expansion on things like um, an appeals process. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're not a, a approved, you can appeal that as a student or a school. If you're a school and you um, are terminated from the program, you can appeal that as well. So it kind of lays out some of, lays out some of those specifics. Now they're temporary. These mm -hmm. are, they are emergency rules so that there's something in place when the law goes into effect on the first. They also approved um, permanent rules for public release. So there's gonna be a public comment period. 
where folks can provide uh, feedback on these on these rules, and the Department of Education will bring those feed that feedback with suggestions maybe for changes to the rules to the board, and they will again have an approval process, mm -hmm. um, and at that point, those will take over these temporary rules that are uh, that we have right now. And of course, these I should say these temporary rules will go into effect immediately pending mm -hmm. uh, approval by the legislature. The uh, Arkansas Legislative Council will meet next week and consider this. Well, this seems to be one of the more fiery portions of the, the of the LEARNS Act with, you know, private school families saying, hey, mm -hmm. we pay, why should these other people, mm -hmm. you know, g get a free ride or per se? I mean, obviously the state is paying, but by eligibility, you sure. mean those students go to a private school of their choice mm -hmm free of charge not necessarily. to the family? Not necessarily. So the educational freedom account will allow state funding up to $6,600 per student, roughly 666, okay. mm -hmm, 600, yeah, 6,600, there we go, uh, per student uh, to for allowable educational expenses. That includes um, private school tuition. It doesn't have to be that necessarily. Um, so it's not a direct voucher in that, like, here's my coupon, you have to let me in. It's that amount. And there are varying degrees of varying amounts for how much tuition is across the state. Um, they started taking applications for the EFA program on June 20th. And uh, through Freedom of Information Act, we requested some applications for that first week. Mm -hmm. So between June 20th to 28th, there were 60 uh, private schools who had applied. Um, uh, most of them were Christian schools. Um, when we kind of mapped it out to see like where they were in comparison to say these F-rated schools, there were a number of counties that still didn't have a private school um, mm. linked to it, even though they have these F-rated schools mm -hmm. like Jefferson County or Crittenden County. But I say yet because applications are open until um, August 1st for both mm -hmm. students and parents, or students and schools, excuse me. I will say that the Department of Education has told me, you know, they want people to apply by the 31st, so you kind of have that day to figure out like if you've missed some documentation or things like that. And then students can continue to apply after the first, but that'll be on a rolling basis and it's contingent upon if there's still funding for them. Mm -hmm. um, they estimate that it'll cost $46 million in the first year to do this program. And yesterday at the meeting, um, General Counsel had said that a little under 3,300 kids have already applied. 1,900 have um, been accepted or been approved so far. There is a cap in the first year of 1.5% uh, mm. of our current uh, student population, which is roughly 7,100. And of course, this is opt in, not opt out. So right. schools don't have to participate. Right. Students don't have to participate. But there will be a limit on who can participate. Well, you know, the governor, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, appointed her first board member yeah. to the Board of Education, uh, former Representative Ken Bragg, who was instrumental in writing the education mm -hmm. legislation. Does this, in your opinion, change the dynamics uh, of this situation? Well, the governor said that, you know, because he has a background with school choice and hel helped so much writing this LEARNS Act that it will help with the implementation, it'll help things run more smoothly. Um, as someone, as, as an author of the bill or someone who helped with it, I suspect that being on the board, it will provide them with some clarity in terms of like the intention of the law and sure. the intention of things like that. So sure. that is what we might see. Well, all right, we have about 30 seconds. Any final thoughts as we approach August 1st? Um, I'm just interested to keep watching and see what happens like everybody else. Um, as a journalist, I, I'm excited to start having questions answered because a lot of times yeah. people reach out to us like, hey, what does this mean? And it's like, we don't know yet. And there's been a lot of like, well, this law passed, what does it mean? And having to say, well, they have to make the rules and they mm -hmm. haven't done that yet. So now we're starting to get in the rulemaking process. And so it'll be good to kind of see how that happens. More to come. More to come. certainly isn't going away. We sure appreciate you, Antoinette Grajeda, the senior reporter for the Arkansas Advocate. Always appreciate your perspective. Thanks, Thanks so much. Coming up, Donna Terrell speaks with the head of Little Rock Regional Chamber of Commerce on how it's working to attract job professionals to the region. A campaign is underway offering people $10,000 if they move to Arkansas and are hired for certain categories of professional jobs. It's being organized by the Little Rock Regional Chamber of Commerce and comes as many employers are having a hard time filling certain positions. Jay Cheshire 
the Chamber's president and CEO joins me now to talk about this. How's the program going? It is going extremely well. As of just this morning, uh, we're now up to just less than 500 uh, submitted resumes. We have over 350 uh, people that have referred folks into the program. Uh, we have 47 partner companies who wow. are uh, considering all of these resumes. So it is going extremely well from the perspective of where we are at this point in the campaign. Sounds good to me. So I, I said earlier, certain categories of professional jobs. So what type of jobs are we talking about? So we actually did a survey of businesses in central Arkansas in terms of a very difficult to find type um, uh, professionals. And, and so we have focused our areas on those medium and above type uh, professionals in IT and marketing and banking, in law, in architecture, in engineering, those types of jobs, as well as some of those upper level jobs in advanced manufacturing. Okay, so it's being called Little Rock Love Connection. That's a nice title and aims to draw not only people from outside of the area, but perhaps people who are from Arkansas to inspire them to come back. So we did a, a massive amount of research before we launched this. And one of the things that we wanted to do was to focus on people who already knew about Arkansas. And so we're doing some social media mining in specific areas with sp specific professions. Um, to date, 33 different states and nine different countries we have applicants from. My goodness. And what we're trying to find is someone who already has a connection to Arkansas. So we don't have to say why Arkansas, but we're saying, hey, you might ought to consider coming home and look at all of these wonderful opportunities. So it's a, it's a different type of campaign than any that we found in the country. Uh, the community benefactor who originated this idea with the offer of a million dollars to help us fund it, um, recognized that we were gonna be very surgical, very targeted at the types of folks that we were going after to try to people, to either bring people back or to give them an opportunity to take a look for the first time. Um, the most recent report shows Arkansas's unemployment rate fell to 2.7%, which is an all-time low. I guess we could say that's a good thing, um, but is, is this combining to make it difficult to fill some job positions? Absolutely. In fact, okay. in most of these programs across the country, they're uh, trying to attract folks to come and work from home. And the last thing we wanted to do was to attract folks to work from home when we have so many companies who need employees and, and professionals at those levels that they're having a difficult time. So with a record unemployment and opportunities, especially in the tech industry across the country where you've seen a lot of layoffs, we felt like this was a perfect time to go into the marketplace, try to attract those folks, again, either to take a look at Arkansas for the first time or to come home. So explain to me, let's say I, I have no connection to Arkansas. Mm -hmm. um, what's going to draw me here? What, what are you um, offering or telling potential uh, candidates uh, that will make them want to come outside of the $10,000. So we're, again, mining social media so that we show up in your feed mm -hmm. and, and it's all about getting you to go to move to LR.com. And when we say Little Rock, it's the entire region. It's basically a 60 mile radius. So we have companies that are uh, actually attracting employees to Pine Bluff, just like we do in Searcy and Conway and, and, and different places around the region. So um, we're trying to get capture your attention through your social media to get you to click on that landing page, move to LR.com. You can go there and see all of the wonderful things that we're talking about in terms of what's available, people who've actually moved here from somewhere else and why, why they love Little Rock, playing off the Love Little Rock campaign that we used to attract Amazon five or six years ago. And so it still has legs in the market from the perspective of people remember it. And so even if you're not from Arkansas and you see see that, we're, we're trying to trigger, hey, I think I remember that, I'll go and take a look. It's upon getting to that website that you then have the opportunity to look at all of these 47 partner companies and the myriad of opportunities that are available within them. And then when, when interested, 
upload your resume and start the process. Uh, I, two things come to mind. How do we compare in terms of job opportunities here compared to Northwest Arkansas, where, you know, I mean, there's a complete different vibe there, and I'm wondering, uh, you know, would, would they need something like this, or, or does that area automatically attract people, and why is it Little Rock and the surrounding areas, as you said, that 60 mile radius, why are we having to do this to get people to come here? So interestingly enough, Northwest Arkansas has a program where they're trying to attract folks. They're being targeted in terms of the geography, Austin, Texas, and places like that, where they're they're trying to attract folks to, uh, to Northwest Arkansas. Tulsa is another great example of someone in our region who's doing the same thing through the Kaufman Foundation. And so, um, yes, we have a significant for example, there are over 1,000 vacancies for nurses alone mm -hmm. in central Arkansas. That's a huge area anyway in terms right. of, of nursing. I mean, they're having problems around the country, but go ahead with your And, and so when you look at those types of, of vacancies and opportunities, the companies have here, sometimes Arkansas seems to be a bit off the beaten path. And unless we give people a reason to think about us, I've often said, People outside of Arkansas don't think badly of us unless we give them a reason to think about us. They're just not thinking about us. And so this is another example of trying to capture attention with folks who have at least a connection to Arkansas or have the opportunity to see it because they're being referred and seeing the opportunities to live here and the quality of life they can have in living in this in this region. Well, I'm, I, I, I carry the flag in terms of telling people to come here because it's a, it's a wonderful place to be. This campaign runs through the end of the month. How many people have applied at this point? So at this point, as of this morning, just less than 500. I think it was 496 uh, that have applied so far in the campaign. And again, the paid media runs through the end of this month. The campaign doesn't finish at that moment in time because what happens is, Donna, if you were to go online and you were to upload your resume, we then take that, that resume and we share it with the companies that have a position that is something that you're interested in, they then start their process of talking with you about their interest mm -hmm. in having you come and work for them. So this process will continue on well into the late fall. What we were trying to do was to capture people's attention in the summer so that if they have families and if mm -hmm. they have children, we get them on the move during the summer as opposed to having to wait until the break of school, for example, at the end of the year. That makes perfect sense. Now, I could win 501 as in 501. One. Yes. Little Rock area code 501, call me. Yeah. <laughs> I could win five hundred and one dollars. How Amen. do I do that? If you are, <laughs> if you refer a friend from out of state into this process, they upload their resume and they then get hired by one of these forty-seven partner companies. And actually, those companies are increasing every week. But if if you get hired by one or that person gets hired by one of those companies, and you're one of the first fifty that have referred and and had someone successfully go through the process, we're going to pay you a five hundred and one dollar finder's fee. I'll take. Or as we say, a love connection fee. <laughs> I love that. Great. Okay, so people can learn more about this online. They can go to www.movetolr.com. And that's where all the information is. That's where all the information is. You can see videos. You can see a whole host of information. We're excited about bringing people and families back to Arkansas yeah. or bringing them here for the first time and helping solve these companies' problems and finding that type of, of employee and helping people see why wow, this is such a great place to live. This whole region is beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful quality of life, great education, great neighborhoods. It's why people ought to look at the Little Rock region. And grab that $10,000. Amen. That would be coming their way. All right, Jay Cheshire, thank you for being here. A great program. Oh, Little Rock Love Connection. How about that? <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Thank you. And that was Donna Terrell. As we close, we take time to remember longtime public servant Charlie Daniels, who died last Sunday at a Little Rock hospital. He was 83 years old. Over the span of about three decades, beginning in the 1980s, Daniels served as Arkansas's Secretary of State, State Auditor, and Commissioner of Lands. He retired his political career in 2015. A memorial was held Friday in the State Capitol Rotunda. Thanks so much for joining us. Again, I'm Dawn Scott for Arkansas Week.
Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR FM 89.